And of course, by now they've realized they've been duped. All of a sudden, they have to face the real uh, inspector, the real inspector general from, from Petersburg. And then Gogol does something that, of course, has become very, very famous in the theater. He has each character suddenly frozen into space in the form of the grotesque position he's had when he hears the news. One man is frozen into a human question mark, as Gogol puts it. Uh, another man is twisted into a kind of a pumpkin. A third is caught uh, in a way where his arms and legs are distended in a, in a gr totally grotesque way. And they stand there utterly frozen, you might say calcified, for over a minute until finally, slowly, the final curtain comes down. It's uh, an incredible piece of theater when it's done well. And of course, it's been done well many, many times, not only in Russia, but of course, all over the world. It's a very popular play. Uh, no doubt some of you have seen various films that have been done here. Perhaps you've seen it on the stage. Now, the play itself aroused a uh, tremendous controversy among the critics in Russia. Uh, they seem to see a certain kind of ambiguity in its text. Of course, those who were trying to defend the good name of Russia were very upset at the picturing of uh, small town life in Russia as being shot through with corruption, with greed, with sloth, with ignorance, uh, that the bureaucrats were uh, uh, totally uh, numbskulls, that they knew how to do nothing but collect bribes from innocent merchants, uh, that the merchants, of course, were not above cheating other people, that the teachers knew nothing, the judges knew nothing, the jails, everything was run badly. Uh, said, that's not true about our Russia. Our Russia is a fine country. Gogol has done nothing but bring slander upon Russia. Now, of course, the radicals and the liberals, perhaps not quite as numerous as conservatives at that time in Russia, but nevertheless there, uh, praised Gogol. They thought that Gogol did a wonderful thing. As a matter of fact, uh, perhaps the most famous critic at the time, a man named Bilinsky, uh, had some very complimentary things to say about Gogol. Uh, to a certain extent, he helped make Gogol's reputation by saying, here is a man who has shown it the way it is. This is the way Russia is being run night, right now, and it's our responsibility to change it. Curiously, the Tsar himself, Nicholas I, said, everyone, and I'm quoting him here almost directly, everyone got what was coming, and I got it worst of all. And Strangely enough, Nikolai, who, who banned so many things that Pushkin did, uh, allowed the play to be put on, gave royal permission for future performances, uh, such as the caprice of monarchs. The Russians like to call it Pharaoh's logic, logika faraona. Gogol himself was somewhat dismayed by the way people received this. He said, look, I was not trying to slander Russia. I was not trying to picture Russia as a, as a corrupt or indecent place. The scene that you see on the stage is nothing but the final judgment. It's the final judgment that Christians talk about what we will all face when we die and when we want to go either to heaven or they, by this judgment they may send us to quite a different place. It's not quite so pleasant as heaven. This is the final judgment. This has nothing to do with politics. Well, of course, <laughs> it's up to the reader to decide uh, how uh, he or she is going to interpret this. Uh, I'll leave it up to you to decide whether it's a day of judgment or uh, something that would make conservatives happy, or liberals happy, or Berlinsky happy, or perhaps you happy. I'll leave it up to you to decide just exactly what it is. It seems to me that to deny satire in this play is to deny the magnificent nose on Gogol's face. To confine it to politics is, of course, totally reductive, because uh, what this play does is to appeal to the human imagination and make it look at human life from many, many different points of view. And of course, most especially at the demonic part of the corrupt part of the individual, which we so often try to hide from ourselves. But it's not entirely about politics. It's about human beings, the life of human beings, and by the way, also the possibility of laughter at many of our foibles, at many of the grotesque parts of our, of our life. Uh, but there again, uh, it's open to many different kinds of interpretation. I leave it to the reader to decide. Uh, now, uh, Gogol also wrote some shorter pieces uh, the Russians were great masters of a genre, a literary genre called, uh, in, in English, usually called the novella. In Russian, the, the word is povist. It's something, it's, some that, it's a work of literature that's somewhat longer than a short story, but shorter than a long novel. And as I say, in Russian, a povist, in our uh, language, the uh, novella. And um, I'd like to talk about two of perhaps his most famous uh, novellas. Uh, the first one comes from 1835. It's called, uh, in Russian, nos, uh, a word that's not so far from the English meaning nose. And it has to do with a nose that, for some reason or other, suddenly disappears. 
mean, how can a human nose disappear? Well, a barber, Ivan Yakovlevich, wakes up one morning and uh, goes to have breakfast. Of course, he's overcome uh, a hangover. As Gogol says, like every self-respecting tradesman, he was, of course, a drunkard. Uh, again, Gogol's notion about Russian life at that time. He, he cuts into his bread, and what do you think he finds? He finds a human nose. What the devil? How? He said, my God, did my hand slip? In shaving somebody, did I, did I somehow cut it off? What happened? And he has no idea where the nose came from or what happened. Of course, he begins to be, be terribly worried. And then the scene shifts to a man named Kovalyov, who is a collegiate assessor, a term that's probably not well known to the American audience. You have to understand that in Tsarist Russia, there was a so-called table of ranks. In the bureaucracy, everyone who served, served in a certain rank, a little bit like the GS ranks uh, in the United States, but these were quasi-military ranks, and each rank had a uniform that went with it. So, of course, from a person's uniform, you knew exactly what level he was in in the bureaucracy, and as you might imagine, there was tremendous jealousy and tremendous fighting to get ahead to different ranks. Kovalyov was a collegiate assessor, which was not a terribly low rank, but then again, not terribly high either. It was the equivalent of a major in the Russian army. And Kovalyov wakes up one morning, here he is a respectable bureaucrat, and he feels for his nose, which is one of his most precious possessions because there's a pimple on one side and a cut on the other side, and what do you think he feels? An absolutely flat place. No wound, no nothing, just no nose. Now, how in the devil can a respectable bureaucrat like Kavalyov go around the city of Petersburg without a nose? It would be a terrible scandal. It would be impossible. It would be grotesque. It would be horrible. What's he going to do? Well, he is a little bit inventive, and he wears uh, an overcoat. As you know, the overcoat is going to come in later. Another story by Gorgon. He takes the large collar of his overcoat, which they wear in Petersburg in the winter. You have to because it's a very cold climate. You have to protect your neck and your face. He pulls it up around his face so that it covers most of his face and nobody would notice. And he goes walking down the street, and what do you think he finds? He walks down the street, and he sees a man dressed in a beautiful uniform. He looks closer, and it's his nose. He goes running, he running, hey, you, get back on my face. Obviously, the nose doesn't hear. The nose rushes off and catches a cab, of course, a horse-drawn cab, to take him to the cathedral to listen to Mass, because the nose is obviously a very respectable person, and goes to Mass at the cathedral. And he goes to the Kazan Cathedral, that very famous place at the central street in St. Petersburg, uh, uh, Nevsky Prospekt. He goes in it, and Kavalyov comes rushing after him, trying to talk to him. He says, look, I don't know. I can't possibly understand what you what are you talking about? You're not making any sense. He says, look, you're a nose. You're not a human being. Get back on my face. Get back where you belong. And suddenly the nose turns to him and he says, I beg your pardon, sir. From your uniform, I gather that you're in a different department from where I am. And furthermore, you're a lower rank. I don't talk to people who are in a different department from mine, certainly not those of a lower rank. And poor old Kavalyov has to go off, having been snubbed by his own nose. You understand that what Gogol is talking about here is, in, is the part in connection with the whole. Geometry tells us that the whole equals the sum of its parts. That means if you can identify something as a part of a whole, that something is bound to be smaller than the whole, given geometrical logic. In the logic of life and the logic of psychology, in some cases exactly the opposite is true. Sometimes the part is much larger and more important than the whole. In poor old Kavalyov's case, that is demonstrated so conclusively and so grotesquely by the fact of his nose being off his face and being even more important than the poor old man. Well, dejectedly, he goes along the street, and the story goes on for a long time. Kavalyov even tries to run an ad in the newspaper. When he tells the editor he's lost his nose, in Russian the word is nos, the man replies, oh, Mr. Nosov. Kavalyov is insistent, no, my nose, not Mr. Nosov. The newspaper man finally comprehends, but objects that they cannot put in such ads since they run a respectable journal. But the journalist does not want to be excessively cruel, so he offers Kavalyov some very nice snuff, or to, to calm his frayed nerves. Our agonized protagonist cries out against such an absurd attempt at assuagement, How can I use snuff, you idiot, when I have no nose to sniff it with? Against such logic, both the journalist and the reader are helpless. Suddenly, for some reason that's completely unexplained, Cavalier finds the nose. The nose is somehow next to him. With great joy, he sticks it on his face. But what happens 
It turns out to be like a piece of rubber. As soon as he lets go, the nose falls. He sticks it again, the nose falls. He tries very hard to push it on one way or another. Somehow he cannot get the nose to stick to his face. So he goes to the doctor. But the medical man finds himself helpless. The nose will simply not fit back on Kavalyov's face. No matter what means the two of them try to use it, it doesn't work. Kavalyov goes home and goes to sleep, and lo and behold, when he wakes up the next morning, what do you think he finds? The nose is back on his face. How did it happen? Gogol says, well, strange things happen in life that are totally unexplainable. They don't happen often, but they do happen. Another story that Gogol wrote uh, that is perhaps uh, the most famous story written by Nurul Gogol. In Russian, it's called Chignel. Uh, it's often translated as the overcoat. Chignel is a kind of a coat with a half shawl that comes down uh, halfway across the shoulders uh, and goes across the chest. Uh, in the United States, you can see this if you watch the Army-Navy game uh, in the f that takes place in the fall. Uh, you'll notice that the West Point plebes, when they march out on the field, wear what's called in Russian chignel, with a, with a cloak that comes over their shoulders and uh, goes halfway down the front and the back of the coat. And uh, there was a man named Akaki Akakievich Bashmachkin. The very name, of course, sounds ridiculous. Bashmak is a kind of a vulgar word for shoe, and Akaki Akakievich have uh, syllables that are probably best not translated from European uh, language that are not very nice words. Uh, he works in an office where everybody makes fun of him. And when they make fun of him, he says, why are you making fun of me? Why are you insulting me? And they suddenly realize that what they're doing is wrong. And they, they realize that this poor bureaucrat standing next to them is their brother. And they should realize this. It, at this point, the, the story seems to be an argument for the brotherhood of human beings. Uh, but Akaki Akakievich soon finds that his overcoat is so torn that he can no longer wear it. His chignel is so torn he can no longer wear it in St. Petersburg. And of course, the climate is bitterly cold. He goes to Petrovich, the tailor. He says, look, you're going to have to repair my coat. Petrovich says, look, I can't repair it. The thing is well beyond repair. You're going to need a new coat. He says, how am I going to pay for a new coat? Well, that's your problem, but you've got to pay. Well, luckily, he has saved up a certain, he saved up something like 40 rubles. He needs another 40. The boss uh, in the office gives him a bonus, which uh, makes up the difference. So he has the 80 rubles. He gives it to Petrovich. Petrovich puts his hand over the coat, folds it back, says, well, here's your coat. And Akaki goes out a new man into Russian society. The people in the office no, matter, no longer make fun of him. This overcoat has become for him, well, how can I say it, almost like a woman. Uh, he's very much attached to it, very close to it. Uh, he feels its warmth, he feels its affection, so much so that they decide to give him a party. He goes to the party. Uh, of course, he, uh, he feels somewhat strange in a, in a place like this. He's never been to the party like that before. He drinks some champagne. Eventually, he leaves the party and uh, go, tries to walk home through the square, uh, square in Petersburg. It's in the dead of night. It's very cold. The wind is blowing. The snow is there. There's a guard somewhere off in the distance, but he's by himself. And he thinks, oh my gosh. What's, what sort of a place have I got? And all of a sudden, if you see somebody saying, this is my coat, I want it, he grabs it off his back and disappears. And poor Lukaki, shivering in the cold, has to go home. He's without his overcoat. He goes to an important person and he says, please, please, help me get, my, help me get back my overcoat. The important person says, my dear sir, do you know, do you know before whom you're speaking? Get out. And Akaki goes home in such despair that he dies from the cold and from the shivering. Well, this important personage then himself goes in a carriage through the square, and all of a sudden he feels a, a hand on his back as big as a pumpkin grab the coat off his back. Here, that's my coat. He looks around, and to his horror, he sees Akaki Akakievich, the, the ghost of the dead man. And of course, the appearance of the ghost in the life of this important personage is another argument for the vengeance that the poor take upon those uh, who, uh, who oppress them. Uh, the tale is a kind of a ghost story. The tale is a kind of a supernatural story, and yet at the same time, it has social and political implications that were examined by those who read it, and we'll talk a little bit about that next time.